The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. Welcome to this week's Crashing Glass podcast. I'm your co-host, Holly Hurley, here as always with Jill Henley. Hiya, Jill. Hi, how's everyone doing tonight? We've got a very special guest, Holly, that I will let you introduce. Oh, thank you so much. I had the privilege um, at Washington University of hearing this lady speak, and she was 1987 Adweek's Woman of the Year. Joining us today, Mitch Myers. Hi, Mitch. Hi there. So, uh, so Mitch, tell us a little bit about your journey here uh, to, uh, we're going to call this executive chick because I feel like you definitely owned the world as the executive chick at one point. And uh, so I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey, maybe inspire some others. Well, when I uh, started college, I had no clue what I wanted to do, probably like most people. Um, I originally thought that I was going to be a music major. I played piano my entire life, and when I got to meet a college uh, counselor, he basically said, what else can you do? What else do you want to do? He didn't think I should major in music. So I had worked in the accounting department of the bank over the summertime, and he said, accounting, that's good. There'll be great jobs in accounting. And so I got signed up to be an accounting major. Um, went through college in three years, got that accounting degree, went out and got an auditing and tax uh, position with a medium-sized accounting firm in the St. Louis area. Worked at it for two years. It was great experience and knew that I never wanted to do that for the rest of my career. <laughs> so, I, yeah. so I literally went back to school to get an MBA um, without much thought, just knowing that I was running away from the at least public accounting world. And there was a company in St. Louis called the Emerson Electric Company, and my brother worked there at the time. He called me up and said, hey, if I... If I suggest that you apply for a job and you get one, I get $500 and I really need the money, so why don't you do it? So I did, and I got hired on, and I was doing accounting work there. Spent a couple of years there, and I learned how to drive tanks and negotiate with the U.S. Army and other Army suppliers, which was very interesting and, again, nothing I wanted to spend my life doing. (laughs) But I started to realize there that, Accounting really was a valuable skill to have in my in my daily week, but it wasn't the career that I wanted. And I started looking at the sales and marketing functions of these companies and thought that's really where I would be better suited. So I, I literally looked around St. Louis and the 7-Up company was hiring. Unfortunately, they were hiring accountants, and that's what my background said I was good at. So... As I went in for the interview, I leveled with the accounting manager and said, look, I'd love to work here. I'll take the accounting job, but my real desire is to get into the marketing department. And so he helped me do that. Literally within 10 months, I had transitioned into the marketing department because uh, they were happy with the way that I was counting their beans, and they were willing to teach me marketing, which, as I've learned, a lot of it is on the job training anyway. So I spent about three years there as an assistant brand manager and brand manager, and once you get into those jobs, then your phone tends to ring for other similar positions, and Anheuser-Busch was looking to hire an assistant brand manager to roll out a new light beer for the brewery, Bud Light. So in 1982, I took that position and spent eight years there, about four years on the Bud Light brand and the rest of the time on new products which included new beers, wines, waters, soft drinks, wine coolers, everything they did in the beverage business. And that was great experience because new products is very fast and furious. And then I left. Uh, a man that I had met in the St. Louis area who was a creative director approached me and said, you know, let's start our own agency. You know, I basically had a great job at Anheuser-Busch. I was um, fairly high-ranking female at the time and the only brand female that they had had in their history and doing well and loving it, but I thought the entrepreneurial uh, opportunity was um, exactly what I was looking for at the time. So I literally walked away from a great job and everyone gasped and fainted and thought I was nuts for leaving that place. Which often Um, means that you're doing the right thing. (laughs) Right. 
Right. Um, and, you know, I was the breadwinner in our family. My husband was a, co- a tennis coach, a college coach at SIUE, which he loved his job, but it, you know, doesn't pay and never was going to pay a lot. But um, I was fortunate to be doing well in my career and, and continuing to move up. So to quit a big company with stock options and all the benefits that I had there, and I had a two-year-old at the time and another one on the way, it was I guess if I'd have thought too much about it, I might have gotten scared, but I didn't. So we started a we started our agency and built ourselves up to ten people and twenty five people and fifty people. And over the fifteen years that we were together, we ended up with three hundred and fifty employees in wow. five uh, offices in five states. Um, this was Forty. The company, you right, Mitch. I'm sorry. This was Zipatoni, the Zipatoni company. This is, yeah, this was the Zipatoni company in downtown St. Louis, and we and we sold our agency. We were about forty-five million in revenue annually. Sold our agency to the Interpublic Group out of New York in two thousand, and that's the time when all of the roll-up strategies were happening with big advertising agencies. They were looking to add capabilities in web development and package design and new product stuff and strategy and promotions, and we did all of that. So it was a great exit strategy for us. Uh, the company still exists, but at that time, we, we had a four-year earnout, and after the four years, I retired and came home to raise my teenage kids. And it all worked out great. So that, you know, taking that chance and leaving Anheuser-Busch when seemingly it was a crazy thing to do, was the best decision that I ever made. Wow. Yeah, and that's amazing because I think that that risk-taking, I, I think a lot about that kind of risk-taking, you know, and professionally and, and sometimes, you know, as parents and as well. But that was, so everyone, you know, mostly everyone thought you were crazy and that, that what, why are you leaving such a secure job with, right. you know, stock up? Right. So what do you think it was that, you know, what was going on that made you say this is the right move? Well, having done, the, you know, a very similar type job in brand marketing for eight years, I sort of found myself being a little bit bored, honestly. I and mean, when I could read two newspapers a day and have time to walk up to the credit union, and I thought, you know, there's something wrong with this. I'm not busy enough. Well, that's what all the, the men that I worked with aspired to do. <laughs> you know, that's what they wanted. and. Yeah. I didn't, you know, having come from that new products area, which is very fast and a lot going on, and I can multitask, you know, in a big way, and that probably taught me how to do it. I I didn't like just thinking, well, next year is more of the same. You take the marketing plan, you change the dates, you change a few things. I wanted to be challenged always. I have learned about myself in 55 years that I'm a lifelong learner, that what motivates me is learning something new every day and all the time. So once I figured out that motivation, you know, it was pretty easy to see being an entrepreneur and no one telling you which clients you have to work with is really what was going to energize me every day. And the best part about that agency job is uh, my partner was absolutely brilliant, totally different type of person than I was, but we were the best, you know, partnership because we were so different and we respected each other's abilities and we hired some of the most talented, amazing young people that I'm so privileged to still have in my life. You know, they really um, taught us so much and were able to then, uh, we were able to attract more smart, fun, young people that we amazed ourselves every day at what we can do. So that's the best part of that agency experience. Well, I mean, you know, you were with Zivatoni, you obviously had, I mean, Levi Strauss, we're talking very high-level clients. You know, PSP, you guys were a big part of that launch. And I, I feel like you, you know, obviously we talked about, actually, I don't think we've mentioned yet, you created Spuds McKenzie, and I want, to, I want you to tell that story because I, I love 
the adversity that you faced in that decision. And the thing that you said that really resonated with me, Mitch, I have heard you say before that you always think it's better to ask for forgiveness rather than permission. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I knew that would resonate with Jill because Jill and I talk about that a lot on the show. So many of the women that we talk to, you know, a lot of our listeners, a lot of the people we've had on the show say, well, you know, I just felt for the longest time that I, I couldn't really do that or I had to ask for permission. And people are always apologizing, saying they're sorry, you know. And I, your, your way of saying it was almost like I have no intention to apologize. I intend for this to succeed. <laughs> right. right. Well, and I think that you have, to, you have to come from a position of, you know, some strength. Like you've got to know your stuff. And you have to be sincere and very honestly, you know, intending to do the right thing. And then I have found that, you know, I mean, I guess when I was coming up in the marketing ranks, you always look at people in senior management positions and you think they must be so much smarter than I am. And I will tell you that every day I would be disappointed being in a meeting or meeting with a client that I had thought was just a rock star just to find out that it's like, you know, not so much. They're just not as brilliant as you had thought or hoped they would be. So over time, you can tend to trust your gut and know that, you know, that your ideas are pretty good and that all you have to do is sell them and that compelling sales story, you know, is really critical. Um, getting people to trust you, getting people to like you, and then you can get, get away with that kind of stuff and ask for, you know, ask for forgiveness if it doesn't work out. Um, but they, they'll know at the end of the day you did it with their best interests in mind, you know, not to be malicious or spend money irresponsibly or anything like that. The Spud, the Spud story was interesting. A lot of people who knew it and saw it, you know, when it was at its highest levels of exposure and success, um, you know, the stories abound about how that came about. And I just chuckle because they're all kind of made up. You know, it's kind of wives' tales kind of stuff. They're I urban was, legends uh, now. <laughs> right, they're urban legends. I was, uh, an, I was the lowest level brand person on the brand team. We had a very serious advertising campaign to launch Bud Light. It was the first time they put the Budweiser name on any line extension. And you would have thought we were asking to sacrifice you know, a human being. I mean, this was a very difficult decision for the Bush family and the brewery to do. So oh. everything had to work. It had to be successful. So this very serious ad campaign was going up against Miller Lite, who had a very funny ad campaign. And this is where I learned, you know, it was about what our senior management wanted, not necessarily what the consumer wanted. Sure. And those can be at odds many times. And uh, it's hard to tell senior management, you know, we shouldn't be doing that. Well, we were in a meeting, and we were looking for some print ideas for college age. And the advertising agency was Needham Harper and Sears at the time out of Chicago. And a couple of young teams came in, and they had this little concept. It was a party animal, party vegetable, party mineral series of print ads. Huh. And, they, and these were the days when you did black and white pencil sketches. You know, now everything's done on a computer and it's full color and completely rendered. And, you know, this was a hand-drawn pencil sketch. That's amazing. So showed, yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they showed this party animal concept. And the vice president, you know, there we would comment after all the things we saw. I thought it was funny. And I was the youngest person, you know, in the room at the time. The vice president of marketing, who was probably 62-ish, looks down the end of his bifocals and says, we will not do dogs for any of the brands at Anheuser-Busch. So they tuck that out away and go on to other concepts. And at the end of the meeting, I said to my boss, I think that party animal thing is really funny. Why wouldn't we do that? He said, you heard him. You know, we aren't doing dogs. So, you know, I thought, oh, well, you know, the brilliant guys know more than I do. <laughs> so about six months later, we were looking for a, and we had actually started a tactical advertising campaign that was more humorous, and it allowed me to go there. But we were looking for some poster ideas for college kids again, and it was a very insignificant part of our program. The, the beer distributors would buy these things. They were cheap. You know, they'd give them out at bars and parties and events. 
So I called the the agency guy and I said, I said, where's uh, uh, where you know where's the guy who was working on that? And they said, oh, he was taken off the Bud Light account and put on the Morton Salt account. <laughs> so I literally found him. He was still at the agency. I said, do you still have those layouts of that party animal stuff you did? And he goes, yeah, I do. And I said, fax it to me. So he faxed it to me, and I got with my account team, and I said, look, I want to shoot this as a poster. And they said, everybody was kind of nervous because they were in that meeting when senior management said no. And I said, nobody's paying attention to this. You know, don't worry about it. So literally, we tried to figure out what kind of dog we could use. They had a channel book looking through it. Somebody on the call said, what's that dog that General Patton had? Looks like a pig. And the other, and somebody else said, it's an English bull terrier. Well, they found the picture, and it's like, yeah, yeah, that's it. <laughs> so we called the kennel club in Chicago. They had three of them. One of them had the patch right over the eye. So we called this family and said, please have your dog at Tucker Studio Thursday. What size sweatshirt does it wear? <laughs> And literally within 48 hours, it went from, you know, in somebody's file drawer to being a produced poster. And that, that photograph, I can't tell you the hundreds of millions of dollars that that photograph appeared on. Shirts and glasses and, you know, you name it. Every premium item that was ever made had that initial shot to begin with. So I brought it back. Everybody is screaming at, you know, we have transparencies then. There's no digital film. Film I'm holding. And everybody is laughing hysterically. And it's like you can't not like this, you know. It's harmless for everyone. So then our marketing plans were like three months later, we were blowing out programs for um, the following year. And I thought this would be a great tool in bars and event places and stuff like that for distributors to have to run promotions. So I blew it all out. I had all kinds of promotions and events, and I had stuffed animals to give away. I had big watches to hang. I had dogs that glowed on the back bar. I had a guy in a big costume dress up and come in and hand all this stuff out. So on Sunday night before we're presenting our plan Monday morning, I'm rehearsing in the theater on the stage, and the vice president of our group looked at me and he said, you're not going to present that, are you? And I said, well, sure, I'm going to present that. <laughs> and I was really proud of it all. He said, he goes, you know, he goes, I like it, but August could fire you on the spot. Uh. And he's done that before. He has fired people on the spot. And I was just really exhausted, and I said, you know what, I'm going to present it. I said, I, I'll take my chances. He might, but I was looking for a job when I found this one, so so be it. So the next morning, we get in there, and we're presenting all the different marketing plans we have and the media budgets, and I get to that part of my speech. Now, this is a theater that's probably holding 100 people. It's, um, you know, all blown up on the screen behind me, so there is no missing or confusing the fact that I'm using a dog in a sweatshirt with a party hat on. So Mr. Bush is sitting right in the front, in the center, and all of a sudden, he starts staring at me. He leans back in his chair, starts staring at me like, you know, he could just burn a hole in you with those eyes. Oh. And, you know, this part of it was probably 15 minutes was part of my presentation. I'm thinking, <laughs> well, Tom may have been right about that. So when I got done, I walked out the end of the stage and sat down over with the rest of my team August jumps up and grabs one of those stuffed animals and comes over to me in front of everyone, in front of the theater, and people gasped. I mean, they really thought, not only is he going to fire her, he's going to hit her. And (laughs) he sat down down in front of me right in my face and said, this is great. Oh, God. That was an amazing moment. (laughs) Well, you know what? It taught me that, you know, big ideas aren't presented as a big idea. You know, big ideas come in very small ideas, and they have to be worked, and you have to put a little gas on the fire. And, you know, it took another year and a half before he got blown out to television commercials and 
you know, going to the Miss Universe pageant and being at the World Series. And, you know, he went to every event, and he was the rock star at the places where we were. You know, but, I mean, it so easily could have stayed in that guy's file drawer as a pencil layout and never seen the light of day. So, you know, I encourage people that, you know, sometimes big ideas don't look like big ideas when you see them the first time. Well, and then when you, when this started developing and this train hit the, hit the tracks and, and I mean, I remember a time when Spuds McKenzie was everywhere. My sister had the poster in her bedroom and, you know, any, uh, any commercial, anytime you turn on the TV, you know, it's there and, and this thing just got huge. And then all of a sudden, every people started turning the other way on it. You know, there was talk. They said, okay, this is bad, but Bud Light is marketing to our children. Children, yeah. Well, that's what happened. Um, Strom Thurmond was a big supporter of getting beer advertising taken off any television program that had uh, an audience composition. Like, if less than the audience composition was over 21, like MTV at the time. You know, that was one, that was a fairly new network when I was there in the early 80s, and it was really, you know, a young adult network, and it was great to have such a thing. Well, he came on the scene and said, these beer marketers are trying to reach underage kids, you know, by advertising there, and they're also, you know, using soft furry animals to try to get kids under 21. Well, that's kind of ridiculous because... You know, if kids are going to drink, they're going to get it illegally. We can't make a market marketing to underage kids. But he was standing on the floor of the Senate shaking one of my stuff's dogs with the TV cameras rolling on C-SPAN, and I'm like, well, that's the end of that. You know, we will be selling the rest of these, and, or not selling, but giving them away in a third world country. <laughs> so it really, everything got pulled way back then, and, you know, I don't, I think they got off of MTV at the time. Well, and I wonder, like, your reaction to this. I mean, obviously, you had a very successful company after this happened. A lot of people don't get back up. You know, like, if you have the biggest thing in the world and then it falls apart, a lot of, I've heard executives and actors, you've heard, you know, tell stories of, well, and then everything fell apart and then you never hear from them again. But the way you maneuvered this this career, you know, this change in the climate, I think probably defined a big portion of the rest of your career. Would that be true? Oh, sure, sure. I mean, I I was on a salary and a paycheck, you know, working for Anheuser-Busch. I didn't personally benefit a nickel from all the Spuds McKenzie work, you know, and that's, that's the problem of working for a corporation. You know, you sign papers that say everything is their uh, intellectual property and you don't take it with you, you don't get any, you know, rights to it. So literally my, my best earning years were ahead when I was doing it for myself. And that's not, it's really not why I left. I mean, I really left because I was so motivated by the opportunity to work with a lot of big clients. You know, I, I knew how to do it for, for Anheuser-Busch and the beer business. So then I was ready to try it for Motorola and Visa and Google and, you know, different clients with different business models because that's what energized me, learning about different, you know, businesses. And just learning new things, like you said. So that was yeah. such an and using and using new marketing tools. You know, I mean, when I think of how the industry has changed the entire 15 years I was in business, and today that speed of change is even more rapid than when I was there. Um, you know, the tools with social social marketing and uh, all the things that are happening now are just completely rewriting everything. Yeah. yeah. So do you sometimes look and say, oh, with all the social media and just like you said, the speed of, you know, that everything, things happen so often in real time now versus, you know, all the planning and all the months that it took. What 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 would you do if you were, you know, net doing working now in advertising? What, what do you think you'd be doing different for your in your for your own decision? You are working now. Well, <laughs> actually, actually, I am. I'm actually my my old partner, my creative partner. 
called about six months ago and said, let's get the band back together, and we are actually um, working. So we're doing very... The boomers. I'm sorry. Yes, that's the boomers. Boomers, yeah, boomers. We are... He really is very focused on the whole, you know, the Internet and social marketing and things like that because, you know, television is pretty much dead. I mean, it's too expensive for most brands, and it's hard to get the number of them. There's just too many networks and too much going on there for people to be really considering that, especially if it's a new product. So we're we're learning, we're relearning, and we're also learning all the new tricks and tools. And, you know, it's just interesting to me because it moves so quickly. You know, when you think about three years ago, Facebook was nothing. And you think about it today, it's actually a marketing tool for major marketers. I, I was at Children's Hospital working on something, and Facebook and YouTube are two of their major uh, marketing tools for a hospital. Wow. So, you know, it's like, again, it, the, it's good that I'm a lifelong learner and I enjoy learning new things because I'm having to do that very quickly. Um, but it's fun. You know, the clients, you know, I say that if our clients haven't gone to jail, most of them have done pretty well and have risen even higher in organizations. So um, a lot of times we're able to talk to the chief marketing officer or the president of a company or the head of a venture capital group, and, you know, they remember us. They, they knew how hard we worked and how successful we were, and it's easier to open doors now. The other thing is I have, you know, with having 350 employees, a lot of them are clients. I was in New York last week, and two of the girls that worked for us are at Diageo in vice presidential jobs. So they're like, you know, come on in. We know what you can do. Mm-hmm. So anyway, it's it's fun. It's interesting. Your ability to, I guess the word, I guess the Kenny Rogers put it best: know when to hold them, know when to fold them. You really <laughs> yeah. seem to be able. You have a feel for making these kinds of decisions. Any advice for the go getters out there? You know, who are thinking they want to be the next Mitch Myers and they want to go out there and they want to become the next VP. Uh, that decision making, I would love just to get a little insight into how how you think through these things. Well. And, you know, mine is really instinct. I, I don't really, it's not as calculating as maybe you just described. Mine, I have good instincts. Yeah. I'm, able to, I'm able to read people well. And I think if, if people work on anything, it should be their communication skills. Because, you know, I, I can sell ice to Eskimos. Um, really, it's about, you know, the homework that you do, how enthusiastic you are, you know, when you come across to somebody that you have a passion for their business um, and you can present it creatively and, you know, you can, you can sell bad ideas if you're a good presenter. Um, yeah. But I think, I just, I really think that how people communicate and how you lead people um, are just critical. We, we had a meeting, one of our first meetings with this new group, we took in some people that we hadn't worked with before. And... I knew the, the man who owned this business, but he said, you know, I want you to meet with my sales and marketing VP, which we agreed to do. And by the end of the meeting, you know, everybody was nervous about who's going to present this and who's going to do this part of the website. And, you know, and I'm like, you got to read the crowd, guys. You can't just go through this, this rote, you know, we're going to present it this way. I mean, I've tried that in the past when I really didn't know what I was doing. And you see people's eyes roll back in their head, and they're not listening. They start doing, you know, now they get on their BlackBerry. It used to be they'd start reading their mail. So pretty quickly, I dumped what we had all said we were going to present, and I started asking specific questions of the, the VP of sales about different brands and don't you sense this. And, you know, now this is coming from experience. Well, once he understood how well... I understood his business, you couldn't shut him up. And, and he was giving us assignments left and right. And when we walked out of there and regrouped, this guy said, I've never been in a first meeting that went that well. And I said, the one thing I've learned, and I just proved it to myself again today, is that the sooner you shut up and stop talking about yourself, 
and start asking these people about their business and their problems and their opportunities, the quicker you're going to get an assignment. You know, and then you have to demonstrate some knowledge and uh, ability to, you know, take something and go in a direction. But, you know, people don't want to necessarily hear you talk. They want to talk about what their issues are, and then you need to say, here's how I can help you. So... That sounds like the instincts, like you said, the the good instincts with reading people and then communicating with them is such a huge part of this. Yes, it is. And, you know, treating people well. I mean, I will tell you that I can, I can meet a CEO of a company and be every bit as comfortable with them as I am with somebody that works in the mailroom. And the truth is I treated them all the same. You know, I was as good to the guy in the mailroom as I was to the CEO, even though the CEO is the one that's going to, you know, provide opportunities for me. I think if you're that transparent, people, they see that, you know, at the end of the day, you are who you say you are. And, you know, you're not someone, you're not different people to different people in the organizations. So that's critical. So talk, talk to me a little bit about the focus of boomers, because I think it's a little bit different than what a lot of media companies and a lot of advertising companies for sure are doing out there? Well, it's quite interesting because the way this got started, my partner called me and said, you know, when I get up every morning, I don't see that fat balding guy in the mirror. He goes, I I see or fat balding 65 year old guy in the mirror. He said, I see like a 45 year old guy, still good looking, still, you know, lots of energy and things to do. And he said, No advertiser is speaking to me. And he said, and frankly, the people in this group have all the money, and they need to be speaking to me. Now, he doesn't mean television advertising. He means Internet marketing and and the image and the message that they're saying. Because boomers have sort of rewritten their entire, through their entire life stage, they've rewritten the rules. And we were talking to these people when they were 21. We know them. They're on our Rolodex, you know? I mean, we know these people. And now we are them. So as we go around and talk to clients, you would just be amazed at how people are finally starting to turn on the light about, you know, we haven't really had them segmented as a different consumer, but we think we need to. Even even pet food companies are looking at it because they're trying to, they're seeing that older people are now not adopting pets as much or giving up pets early, you know, and they're wondering what's going on, but they've never been a target. So every, you know, food product, think about it, you know, everything that P&G sells, I mean, <laughs> there's really an opportunity um, I think across any category in any company if people look at it that way. And when you do look at who has the spending power, you know, if you are going to spend money at it, you need to have the right message. No, that makes perfect sense. And it's actually interesting. uh, after 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 I met you at first and decided I wanted you for sure on our show, I was fortunate to get my internship at, uh, I'm going to Kimberly Clark for the summer and I'm going to be working on Depends. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, exactly, right? And I had this conversation with my mother, and she said, I have a lot to share with you on that because she said, they're not marketing to me. And and her father, she had gone through taking care of her father while he was dying, and he wouldn't wear his. And she said, they're not marketing them correctly to to sell them to me. And I I was like, all right, Mom. And I talked to my manager, and he sent her a box, you know. And, and like, now we've opened this dialogue with my mother. Well, and and just look, I mean, I don't know if she's, got any marketing orientation but she's she's a consumer and she's saying you're not talking to me (laughs) so i mean just think about actually i was talking to these girls at diageo the one woman is responsible for all of whiskey worldwide for diageo it's their biggest brands and you know alcohol beverage marketing is always targeted to you know 25 to 35 year old guys or whatever she said, you know what, we just talked about this last month. We really think, because these people grew up drinking it, they're still drinking it at 55, 60, 65, there is no marketing to them. 
<laughs> so we think it's a, you know, we think it's pretty wide open. For that. Plus, they're the ones with the money, like you pointed out. About That's exactly right. That's exactly right. We just learned that um, there's a new show being produced for NPR out of Minneapolis. And it's all targeted. It's going to all be targeted to boomers. I mean, if you think about, you know, some of the health care things and, you know, just anything, travel, food, wine, um, they, they're they creating an entire segment just targeted to boomers. So we're trying to get in touch with them to see if we can't do some programming work with them, bring them stories, you know, maybe even look for some tie-in opportunities with clients in a tasteful fashion that they fund stuff for them. Um, so anyway, it'll, it's going to be fun. Yeah. So you just, Mitch, you just got back into it then because you you had been retired for several years, right? Completely yes, retired? I, yes. I, well, I was completely retired. My kids were, um, when I came home, my daughter was in seventh grade and my son was a freshman in high school. So I was very fortunate to be around them, I think, in pretty formative years for them, um, you know, they would say to me, well, what are you going to, what are you going to do all day? And I'm like, I'm going to boss you around all day. That's a full-time job. Yeah. <laughs> but it really was, it really was great. And I was really happy to be here at that time. Um, the good news is when I was, when they were young, they, I'd take them to the office with me all the time. It was a very creative environment. You know, they loved being there. So they remembered that mom worked. But then when they were teenagers and, you know, had to be watched a little bit closer, they remembered that mom was here every day and had something for them to eat when they walked in the door and helped with homework and stuff like that. And now when they're both started getting into their careers, you know, they remember the mom the worked part. So both of my kids are in this marketing and promotion arena now. And we're constantly collaborating on things. My son is creating this little web company with another buddy, and we must talk two hours a day, you know, on their startup stuff. So it was really perfect. Yeah. that's And I love that you can, I mean, I agree, you know, being, having two, you know, two kids, you know, pretty young kids, but to show them that both here I am, I'm here for you, you know, when you need me, and they're not quite, you know, my oldest is not, he's not even a preteen yet, but he's working, he's almost nine, so he's working on it, and then, but then also for them to see, oh, well, mom also, you know, does this work, she does this podcast, or she goes and does other things, and, you know, and and to show them that, those two sides, because I think you're right, Mitch, when they're, once they're grown, and they're working on careers, and then eventually working on becoming, you know, someday being parents themselves, it all comes back, they remember how well, they remember it all. They remember yeah. it all. My daughter's so interesting. Um, she's a senior in college, and she's met a lot of different types of kids in school, and a couple of her roommates are all just on the program. Let's just, you know, marry a gra- great guy and get married and have kids, and she thinks that's so foreign. Still, still exists. You know, she <laughs> said, she said, Mom, I can't imagine not making my own money and being independent. Well, that's because mm-hmm. she saw me do that, and she saw how easy it has made our life. You know, my husband and I both worked, but the fact that I worked as well and I sold a company, it really made our lives very comfortable. And she realizes that, you know, she never wants to be that divorced mom with four kids that is, you know, begging for money from somebody. She wants to, you know, she wants to control the situation. I never said those words to her, but she observed it. You know, and that's exactly what she wants to do. So I think that's important, you know. I think I think Jill and I actually had similar experiences with our moms that we've talked about a little bit before, and that was our reason for, you know, becoming women who work. And Jill actually, I mean, I, I know, Mitch, you wouldn't have known this, but Jill was a, was a coach and an athlete. She ran the 400, and I just, I think it's, I always think it's amazing, Jill, the choices that you made to make sure that you had a good balance between your work life and your home life. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, I, I try. It's, it's definitely, I'm definitely hit that, um, I don't know, precipice (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, recently where I started going through it, this, you know, like a kind of a crisis where I'm like, well, okay, what am I, what is, what's next? What am I, what am I, what am I supposed to be doing? Because now my kids are no longer 
see, these are toddlers. They don't need all of my, you know, energy. Right. <laughs> and right. so, yeah, it's in, so I, I the, the part of me that it's interesting to see in the kids already, my kids already, even though they're so little, is their um, enthusiasm for, you know, that, you know, that I did, that I am a, an athlete and, and right. that will be something that they'll take with them, you know, through that my, you know, my mom was, she was running and she was a track runner in college. And, you know, that's the, even though they don't like Mitch was saying, you know, even though right now they couldn't put that into words and I don't talk right. about that. It's just that example. So. Well, and you know, my husband would always say, like, I would get frustrated when the kids weren't studying as hard as they should have, because I knew that they had more potential. And, you know, he would say, don't gripe at them. He said, just set a good example and they'll follow. And I'd go stomping into the room and say, I'm setting the example and they're not following. <laughs> he goes, trust me, they will. And he's absolutely right. I mean, when, these, when kids go away to college, that's when that light bulb goes on. And they realize, oh, wow, that's what mom meant. You know, when you get those phone calls from your daughter when she calls back and she says, thank you so much for cleaning my room and my filthy bathroom, you know, all of those years. Oh. And I'm so sorry I made you buy those prom dresses and homecoming dresses. What a waste of money. <laughs> it's, just, oh. it's hilarious. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That is great. I, yeah, it comes, when that comes back like that, I, you're just, as a parent, you're like, oh, I must be doing oh. something right. <laughs> right, right, right. You know, I think it's interesting. This is probably... It will be probably the first generation where, I mean, if the movie What to Expect When You're Expecting is any indicator, where men may actually have this same conversation. I could not imagine my father and his friends, or even, God bless him, actually, I think my current husband and his friends might have this conversation, but no no other generation of males. I don't, I've don't. i never heard, I listen to a lot of podcasts that are very male-dominated, and I've never heard them having the conversation of what my children learned from me and picked up from me and took to college with them. Wow, that is interesting. I never yeah. thought of that, but it makes sense. Yeah. And I just wonder if we're the first generation of that, you know, or if that's coming down the pike or if it right. doesn't ever right. exist. Yeah, it, I, I think that sometimes it has to do with instinct uh, instinct, and, and intuition, and I think that some men have it, but not as many, you know, percentage-wise of men have it. Women, it just comes, it's more of a natural um, right. attribute. I think my my um my dad was very good about understanding kind of me you know setting an example or showing us I, I think he I don't know if he would have said it in these words but he was concerned that he wanted to set a certain um, lifestyle environment at home that made us be you know kind of tough like tough little girls and not wimpy girly girls <laughs> and yeah um, and you know I would say my dad. Um, I, I learned my sales skills from my dad. He doesn't know that. You know, he doesn't realize that those dinner conversations where he would be talking about, uh, you know, what he, he sold insurance and what he did and how he talked to him. And he was a very, um, he would always touch you, you know, and he had great eye contact. Mm -hmm. And he was just, you know, kind of talking and sharing with the family. And my two brothers could have cared less. They just wanted to be on the swing set. You know, let's get out of here. But I would listen. So I picked up on, you know, all of his technique. And I know that he wasn't doing that thinking, I'm going to teach her my sales techniques. Right. But just the stories that he would tell and how he told them, it stuck with me forever. You know, and every time I'm sitting and talking to somebody and I touch their arm, that's my dad reaching through me. You know, that's what he would do to me when he was relating that story. So, um, you know, those things are really, they're really important to kids. And you never know what they're picking up on, but to not have them doesn't provide any hope of them picking up on it. Right. <laughs> Mitch, what did your father sell? You said he was in sales. He sold life insurance products, you know, life insurance, annuities, and stuff like that. Um, and, and he worked for very, they would, worked for a small agency, and then they were acquired by a bigger agency and a bigger agency. So he actually um, retired from that business. Oh, wow. Wow. It, it's amazing that you mentioned that because I've often said in my adult life, I remember as a kid, my sister and I both said that we were nothing like our father. We didn't understand him. He was an alien from Mars. 
But then, you know, as an adult, I did always listen to everything that my father said. My dad was also in sales, and I picked up, uh, my family's in steel, actually. My mother was the quality assurance manager in the foundry, and my dad was the salesman. Oh, and, wow. Uh, Oh, yeah, she wore hard hats and boots. You know, all the other moms wore their, their dresses to lunch, and my mom wore her hard hats and boots and pearl oh. snap shirts. <laughs> I, love, I, love, I love talking about my mother that way. I'm very proud of her. But, uh, you know, but my father was, as I get older, I realize when I go home, my mother sometimes says to me, wow, you're your father's daughter. And she never said that when we were little. Everybody always said, you look like your mother. If you met the two of us, you would definitely think I'm my mother's daughter. But a lot of the actual skill set that I acquired did come from my dad, but it's like you said, I don't think he would have ever, at least never been comfortable saying out loud. No, oh, that's no, me. they, no, no. I don't think they even, they intend that, you know, that's not their intention. And, you know, as you said, I think women have that nurturing gene that, you know, that's just sort of what we do in our own family, our kids and friends and people that work for us. That's why I think... I've had a lot of people talk to me about um, the glass ceiling and, you know, do you feel like you were discriminated against because you were female in these other companies? I can tell you at Anheuser-Busch that, you know, there were a couple of promotions that probably should have been mine, but I didn't get them because I was female and I was young and they, you know, they had no precedent for that. They didn't know what to do. Um, but I never looked at it that way. You know, I never thought. I thought, this has been a great job. Look at what I've earned. Look, you know, look at what I've learned that I can take with me. I, I was never looking behind me. I have said that I think women will be much better managers and senior managers and people running their own business because they nurture other people. We care what people think. You know, we're worried about somebody's personal life because it's going to in interfere with their business life. And we figure out a way to make them, you know, be able to manage both. It's important. Um, whereas sometimes men just don't want to deal with that. Yeah. I think of some of the biggest uh, triumphs and some of the biggest errors I made when I was in production and managing people. And... I often feel like some of the biggest triumphs came out of me just being very human and very, very, you know, like you said, caring about how people's personal life affects their work and vice versa. Right. Right. Whereas right. I think a lot of the mistakes I made was denying that instinct when I was trying to be tough. And I didn't ever let my personal life interfere. And I think sometimes I held people to this standard that was so unreachable that I actually was quite unpleasant. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. I guess you have to realize that it's it goes hand in right. I mean, people are in, they're complete, they're whole. You know, they can't. It, it's hard to separate that their personal life completely and just put it out of the way when they're when they're trying to be successful at work. Well, yeah. I mean, we're all people, right? It, yeah. When it happens to us, we understand it. When it happens to our employees, it's like, oh, I don't want that to happen. I mean, you know, there are there are real bad things that happen to people when. When you have 350 employees, you make some bad hires. You know, and I had people that came into our company with some issues, you know, chemical and alcohol issues that we didn't know. There weren't any boxes to check to say, you know, do you have this? And you can't just chuck them out when you find out they have those problems. You have to treat them. You have to, you know, you have to try to make them better. And, um... It's like every, everybody's human and everybody has some issues, so that's, that's right. unless you're just going to be dealing with robots, you got to deal with it. If I, it's fascinating to me with as going through life and, you know, as as I get older, you really do. That is a lesson that I have learned more recently that everyone has their stuff, right? Everyone has their issues and, and that in different ways, different types of issues or, and I, how much can you, um, you know, how can you help them, right? Work through it as their manager. I think that's a great, that's a great point. Well, and you know, it speaks volumes about you because if other people look and see that you have compassion for somebody that's got problems and it might be really mucking up the work, but if they see you have compassion, they're working with these people to try to help them. You get credibility throughout your company. You know, that is like, that is like the good stuff you can't buy. Um, so it really helps with the culture 
of your and in in the business that I was in it was all about people. We we weren't making beer or widgets to sell. Every asset we had walked out the door at night. Right. So protecting and taking care of that talent was what permitted us to build a great company, you know, with great minds and people that would run through walls for you. Um, Are you talking about, you're talking about Zipatoni now, Zipatoni. right? Zipatoni. Yeah. Um, Mitch, I have one, I don't know how much time, more time you have because this has just been such a, it's just to sit here and listen to you, it's just fascinating. <laughs> um, well, thanks. I really, it's really great. Um, I just wondered about that moment where your uh, colleague said, yeah, he's going to fire you if you, you know, August Bush is, you know, he's, August is going to fire you on the, he might fire you on the spot. And you said, well, I'm going to present it anyway. I wondered if you thought deep down um, that 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 really wasn't going to happen, that you knew, I mean, you were taking that risk, but that you knew it was such a good idea because of your instincts and that that you went ahead with it and you kind of knew it was going to be okay? Or did you really think that it could go either way? You know what? I I knew that the the funny thing about this, and this is one of the things you learned working there, you really did get your review from senior management that day. They passed little slips of papers with numbers on them. And this is like, you know, this is like the Boy Scouts or something ridiculous, but they did this. So when somebody was presenting, they would have little pieces of paper and they'd write numbers on them. And then they'd throw them in the trash can and the next person would come up. And I think that this was senior management one time where they got to review all their marketing people and you know, so there was a little bit of, you know, voting them off the island going on that day, and I knew it. The truth is, I also knew, I felt just as strongly that it was a good idea. Mm. It wasn't, you know, harming anyone. It was a good idea. I had had a little experience with it for six months, and it was selling beer. And that was my job, was right. to sell beer and to get people, you know, enamored with my brand. So I thought, if he fires me because he's in a bad mood, I don't want to work here anyway. You know, it's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. And I also knew that I had the capability of going somewhere else that somebody else would probably pay me, you know, to take a brand job. So, you know, it just really wasn't a consideration and I didn't worry about it. Right. You had the, you had the, um, you had the stuff to back it up, right? You had what was right. needed. Right. And I was selling it. Remember what I said? Bright lipstick. I was selling it. <laughs> My my favorite part of all of this is, and I we're gonna talk actually for uh, Chick News after this. We're gonna talk about the Hunger Games and uh, and what it really amazes me about your story. And I find the stories I like the most are that typically bravery can be an accidental thing. You know, like you right. talk about you you said you know I knew this was a good idea and I knew someone else would hire me. You know that that moment in it sounds so simple when you say it. But it's kind of like you, you said in that moment that you just had to, that was the thought you had, and you just, you have right. to go forward. There's no way but forward. Right, right. And, right. I, I and, that. and that's a confidence, too. I mean, I think a little bit of that is intrinsic. It's who you are. You're hardwired to be a warrior. Or you're hardwired to be confident. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I was confident. I, I had done good work. And I just wasn't fearful of the old boy network coming in and somebody being in a bad mood or not getting it. And, you know, and, and I think about the man that shot it down. Now, he took credit for that campaign for probably eight years. Oh. You know, I can't tell you how many television interviews he did because he was the vice president of the marketing. You know, never did he say, you know, wait a minute, I canned this thing when I first saw it. Yeah. You know, that was never in the press release. Oh. <laughs> He said, no dogs, right? We're not doing he dogs. He said, no, we will never do a dog. This bird will never do a dog. Oh, wow. So, and now look at all the dogs they use in beer advertising. Everybody's got dogs. Right. Here we go. <laughs> yep. Bud Light went back to the dog concept years after you left. <laughs> yep. And Volkswagen has a dog now. It was the dog that was in the Super Bowl this year. right? Or the right. last year. Right. Oh, dogs owned the Super Bowl this year. I mean, that's practically prophecy right there. There was a, I believe it was an Adweek article, actually, about the dogs just owned it. And, you they know, did own the Super Bowl, yeah. 
Yeah, headed up by WeGo with Bud Light because they just said, right. hey, what dogs work for us? Well, yep. wasn't Bud, wow. Bud's day, Mackenzie's debut was uh, on TV was on the, during the 1986 Super Bowl. Is that right? Right. Uh, which yes. was it happened to be the Patriots because I remember, I remember <laughs> they, they got killed. Well, I, re I remember um, trying, like, the first time when we would do photo shoots with this dog, the family lived in Chicago that owned it. The, the mother, she had two teenage kids at the time, she would fly down with Spuds in a regular dog crate, and he would go in oversized baggage. You know, they would put him in cargo, and here this dog would come up in oversized cargo. My husband had a Bronco at the time, so I would always drive that Bronco to work, and I'd pick up Jackie and Spuds at the airport. No one would help us. You know, we'd be swepping this dog on wheels trying to get him to my car in the parking lot. We'd go to the photo shoots and the video things. Well, then, you know, once he hit the Super Bowl and he had the spudettes around him, he was always in a big stretch limo. Oh and God. one time, my son was about 18 months at the time, and they pulled up to the brewery. Here's the big stretch limo with Jackie and the dog and the three spudettes. So I'd give him a back seat with my son and... You know, Spuds is a dog. Spuds is licking Zach's face, you know, like any dog would. And I was laughing. I got some cute pictures of that. But I said to Jackie, I'm like, Jackie, I never meant for this to happen. You know, stretch limos, girls in Lycra, I am so sorry. I never thought it would go this far. <laughs> and every year, they would, Spuds would send me flowers for my birthday. Oh. It was a female dog. She was just absolutely the sweetest. That breed is a very aggressive breed of dog. So we were very lucky to find somebody, you know, that quickly, just pull somebody out of the book and get one that was so trainable and good to work with. And the things we put her through were amazing. Well, it's ironic that she was female because, of course, she's good to work with. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And especially if she had a little sliced beef tenderloin, she was really good. <laughs> That's great. Oh, well, Mitch, thank you for joining us. You, it's up to you if you want to stick around and talk about the Hunger Games or if you... Well, uh, you know what? I'm still the mom. My daughter's home on spring break, so I've got burgers going on the grill. Good thank luck you. to you guys. Thanks thank a lot. You. Thank you so much. So, coming into our chick news segment, this weekend the Hunger Games caught fire, as they like to say, because Katniss Everdeen is the girl on fire. Uh, 155 million domestically, 214 million worldwide. Wow. And I was in the audience for this, and, uh, and Jill, I know you've read the books. Yeah. So, I gotta say, strong female lead, not your typical uh, girl on film. And I... I liked the movie. I, I'm, I know that you can't compare so much, but I liked the movie almost even more than I liked the books because I, I liked seeing it translated to screen. You did, yeah. I'm, I'm, um, I, I'm very excited. I'm going to try to see it this this coming week, and um, and I'm, I'm reading like I said, I'm on the second book. She's, I like how you said to Mitch, um, and you referenced the Hunger Games, that sometimes bravery is by accident, right? So mm -hmm. I with Katniss Everdeen in the Hunger Games, I really think that that applies to her. You know, she was this, she at 11 years old, she had to what, take over as head of her family. And, and that sort of, I don't know how that plays out in the movie, but I know in the book, that was a big theme where she was, she was the one who, and, and through those, those really hard years, um, while she had to feed her family, she became very brave, you know, very brave, and then was able to use that bravery to win the Hunger Games. Yeah, I, I agree, and I think every, what I thought amazing about the books and the film was she is a strong woman. She does what she wants to do in every situation, or at least what she thinks is right, if she can't do what she wants to do in almost every single situation for the good of everyone involved. But a lot of times she messes up, and a lot of the flaws in her personality are filled by the people around her. And she is, kind of like Mitch said, as, as a good executive, very generous with making sure that the people who helped her get there, she tries so hard to take care of her employees for all intents and purposes or the people who got her there, or even her. the people who get her into trouble. You know, even Effie Trinket, she tries to take care of Effie, you know, like. 
Yes, she does. Right. She, she's, she is that type. She, and how she treated, um, you know, how she felt about the, the little, um, the little girl that, um, Mm -hmm. what reminds me of the name of the Rue. uh, Rue. Yes, that's right. It was Rue. And how she had that really soft spot for her and for, and, and just the fact that the book, when I was reading, you know, that, that first book and I, and I, you know, it gets you right from that first page because it mentions the, the reaping is that day. And you know, like you can tell from the writing, the writer makes it seem like, okay, that's a big deal. And it's not a good thing. <laughs> and you can, it draws you in. And then on page 20, only page 20, which is very quick to, I thought to reach this climactic point, which is when her sister Prim, Prim's name, Primrose was called out, you know, as the tribute. And so right from there, and for the rest of that book, and then going through two more of the, the in the trilogy, Katniss is this this um, hero, you know, that that sacrificed her life for her sister. And I mean, what? How can you be more brave than that? <laughs> well, I, I don't know. And honestly, that is that is to me one of the beauties of the Hunger Games. I actually talked about how, and especially for women in this day and age. It really juxtaposes the necessity of a hard time and the and and the difference, you know, what it costs everyone else, you know, what luxury costs everyone else. You do have the people who are living high on the hog. You have that separation, if you will, between the highest class and the lowest class and yeah. and sort of that tension that it causes. And I feel like we're in a place in our country where this is so resonant and it just couldn't be more timely I because know. of sort of the frustration that people are feeling, but that need to take control of your own destiny right yeah I think that when this when the writer um, when she it's Suzanne Collins when she was I think this was all in her head the, this political social environment clearly was as well as the whole reality TV phenomenon yes <laughs> all this stuff Very was like her. knocking around her brain while she was writing these books and to and then to um, show like you said the juxtaposition or to show the she made it just more of an extreme uh gap between the haves and the have-nots and and it reminds me of a lot of how you know the chant that the occupy movement has had which is we are the 99 percent um and i just that i mean whether you know whether whatever wherever you fall and how much you agree with you know the occupy movement and the uh but it's just what i like is that it's showing that there is this this disparity and that um in the hunger games the, the trilogy just really shows that there's such a a lot like holly mentioned a widening gap between the people that are struggling and the people that are getting richer i agree and that's and that to me was so poignant and so sort of a part of our times but i also feel like i, I just think comparatively and I'm a huge fan of a lot of the literature that's been out. As you know, I'm a big nerd for most books. Uh, I think I just think Katniss is a great hero, and I think she is she is flawed inherently and a catastrophe in a lot of ways. And I think that makes her even more appealing. And you know, people drawn you know drawn parallels to Star Wars and all that sort of stuff. But I think going into this is important that you experience it for what it is and just really enjoy it because I don't I can't think of a movie series in history that's aimed at such a broad audience that starts from such a bleak place and ends in such a truthful place, which I won't ruin anything for you, Jill. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> like, there's so much truth within the series and so much complexity, and I just, I support that. Yeah, it, and she, I just, I do, I like, I like so much that, g- given, you know, my, what drives me and, and some of my personality, that she's so, um, oh, she's so tough. She's so physically tough. She's so in touch with, you know, the outdoors because she has to be. And she learned that from her dad, you know, hunting and, and trapping. And just that idea that here's this girl who is just a physical, tough and brave. And you're right. It is, it is, it, it has this huge range of, um, you know, people are reading this all the way from, oh, I want to say age, uh, age 10. Oh, nine or ten and then all the way up you know and I think that the, I think the movie will probably appeal to an even broader audience than the books because the, the books that the movie may appeal even more to guys than the books might have I agree and I I just can't wait to 
to see more from this series and I'm excited to have some great chick news and it's just been great to have our executive chick on this week and talk about this with you Jill. Yes, it was a good show. I, it's, I also thought it was kind of neat that uh, the coincidence that we had um, Mitch, the you know the branding advertising chick on tonight, and that Mad Men is premiering tonight, um, which is <laughs> which I'm excited about. Chick, uh, in her case, Mad Chicks, but, if you will. Right. So yeah, because I know you know Mad Men is a. Well, I, we should have, too bad we, you know, couldn't have gotten, we'll have to um, circle back with Mitch to see what she thinks about that, that show and whether it's, she thought, it, she thinks it's an accurate depiction of the uh, 1960s <laughs> world of advertising. She'll probably just tell us it's before her time and she wouldn't have noticed if it was going on, but we'll have to ask her anyway. I'm so curious. Yeah. All right. Well, have a great week, Jill, and I'll see you guys next time for our next Trashy Glass podcast. We'll be back next week. Thanks, Holly. Bye.